one thing with a game like this, I'm taking a look at, well, with this system in particular, I'm taking a look at, hey, I got the Army of the Cumberland here. It was dug in behind the river facing the Confederates. But I kind of have to move into this position. And this is a problem because if I move in there, I'm in a situation where, not to here, I don't think. I don't think I'm getting closer to Atlanta by doing that. But, you know, there's a couple of Confederate, possibly full core, that can just slam into me and destroy whatever I've got there. Now, the Confederates have a pretty good idea of what the Union's facing them with. They know what was here, a part of the Army of the Cumberland and all of the Ohio. And the Army of Tennessee is kicking around down here for the most part. They, and hasn't had an opportunity, unless it slipped around behind, to reinforce that. So it's pretty clear that this is a dangerous space. And I might have missed that opportunity. Had I noticed, you know, had I not noticed it during the Union turn, I probably wouldn't notice in the Confederate turn. It's one of the problems of playing solo, <coughs> uh, especially since I play one turn after the other. So, you know, it's not like my thought process are like, huh, what about that? So in this particular case, the Union is aware and is going to go forward. But I could see in an opposed game very easily someone moving forward here and the Confederates saying, you know what, I know what you got there, you bastard. I'm going to just roll into you. <laughs> and, you know, uh, gaining a significant point value here, threatening the whole rail line going up, uh, there, there's a lot that could happen there. Now, there are ways around this. Not advancing into here with the... Uh, the supply train, which is why I'd have to go into here. Well, actually, I don't need the supply train. In fact, I don't even need it here. Uh, but this is going to slow down the movement of the Army of Tennessee, having seen this risk. And I'm lucky I saw it, rather than finding out when the Confederates come busting in on me. Okay, so there's another side to that, though. I can try to lure the Confederates to make that attack with a bunch of dummies, too. And that, that's one of the things. Now, I don't know if there's a weak force here. I know there's something back here digging in. But I don't know if there's a weak force here that I should pay attention to. Or, you know, is that just a risk that I'll be putting myself into an exposed position where I get attacked? And that's... That's one of the problems. <laughs> uh, a lot of bluffing available here. Can you take the chance? Probably not. Seeing that, probably you can't take the chance if you see the Union move forward. Now, if this stack had just moved forward and not left a lot of dummies around there, that would be one thing. But what I've got set up there, I can't tell. Um, these guys can't even leave because... Uh, and speaking of which... He didn't have to go there. He could go here. These guys can't even leave um, because uh, they haven't made an attack in a long time. By the way, it's raining for whatever that matters. That might make attacks more valuable because the CIC table, uh, the actual intensity goes down. And so like with a... Um, with a diversionary attack, you're very unlikely to get hurt by that. And that would give me mobility, but I don't think I really need it, although it's appealing. Um, <laughs> mobility is the only thing it would give me. I'm not going to be able to cause a lot of damage if I'm doing a diversionary attack. I'm probably, because the Confederates are entrenched, I'm probably at best going to get out of this scot-free, and that's even unlikely if they have some strength. So I'll probably take a couple of losses trying to get out of there. So I'd rather just plug in there. Um, sending Cav around here. When I tried to leave here, the Confederates intercepted. They have a whole bunch of Cav. They're hoping to knock that out, but I threw the additional Cav in from Pine Mountain. What do I want to do with this guy is my last question. Um, And I think a threat down here. Again, trying to at least force their cav back so that, you know, I peel it off the line. It doesn't end up adding a couple of strength points to firepower and stuff like that uh, by making threats. Now, obviously, I could be getting a couple of strength points on my own lines. 
but the Union wings tend to be fairly strong because they're a whole army. And, I, and you know, yes, the Confederate Corps are pretty big compared to the Union Corps, but they're still like two Union Corps is enough to get you up to uh, the top table here. And so I've got a lot more padding. I can take more hits than the Confederates can um, without you know falling below that 21 level, just because I got bigger, more unit, more more strength points in play. Confederates had a slight disadvantage in the. Uh, in the combat, the cav combat, because they're the attacker, but they got away killing a Union unit uh, strength point and without taking any losses of their own. And they're kind of a crapshoot because you're, I did a diversionary attack with the rain. There's no way the CIC is going to come into play. And, uh, I mean, it could if it was horrible odds, but the odds were in my favor one-to-one. -one. Um, and then the firepower table, we were looking at something like these two columns here, so... You know, the Confederates on the slightly worse column, but they rolled a little better, you know. <laughs> it's kind of a crapshoot. Uh, when, you, when you're when you throwing the big units at each other, eh, you could pretty much, you can't guarantee exactly the results. Again, somebody could get lucky and somebody unlucky. Uh, that's, that's the nature of the game. But here you're talking about such low amount of strength points that you could start with the cav, that you could start seeing somebody getting a cav advantage through the fights in a way that, hmm, I'm not sure, you know, it takes a lot longer to develop for the infantry. All right, on to the rebels, and we'll see what they do in this muck. One thing is, uh, in, the, in the historical write-up for this, rain seems to slow and stop everything. Eh. In the system itself, it doesn't really. Force marching is too, too big a penalty, uh, for, for the most part, to do very often. Um, you take that straggle loss too much. Yes, the rain makes it harder to do, but that's really the only thing that's impacted by it. Actual fighting, not heavily impacted by the rain um, in terms of the desire to fight. Uh, certainly, you know, you're not going to get as intense a fight because the CIC gets reduced, but it actually kind of might be the edge that allows the attacker to say, yeah. I'm willing to fight now because I won't take the damage off the CIC table that the attacker just tends to take. Uh, of course, with the entrenchments, it doesn't make any sense to fight because your firepower is very unlikely to break through the entrenchment uh, on its own, unless you have a, a huge numerical advantage or something like that. You know. Confederates pull back to their next line, trying to cover all the kind of extraneous ways across the river that there are. There's nothing down here that's nice <laughs> because otherwise the, the U.S. cat, the Union Cav, could break me up. Um, push this here. Rain doesn't mean as much in this as it did in uh, Lee Takes Command. Um, it doesn't wash out the rivers or anything like that. It's, uh, so, you know, we can make crossings where we wish to. But, uh, yeah. And it looks like, yeah, it's going to come down to a fight somewhere. Where? Who wants to do what? Well, like I said, the Army of Tennessee eventually is going to be able to start pushing its way towards threatening what's over here. I also have weaker Confederate forces here, but i got to be careful. Because if I move those in, i got to protect uh, that space as well as this space or this one. Um, so it doesn't look like I can push in this direction very easily. Uh, I could also go hi-ho diddle-diddle right up the middle, but that doesn't look good. <laughs> it really doesn't look good. So my best hope right now is Army of Tennessee. And the nice thing about that is McPherson is my best leader attack. If I could lose Thomas and get, uh, oh, who replaces him? Logan, I think. Um, then I'd have a little bit more violence on that side of things. And the Union pushes forward. Uh, you can see we filled in that center area. We've got Army of Tennessee moving up here. We don't know what's here and what's there anymore as the Confederates. The Union obviously knows. And we're making calf pushes on both the flanks to see 
cav can leave an area if they meet the combat requirements and the density requirements, at least here, aren't going to be there. This, I think the Confederates have enough density. If I use the density rules from uh, Lee Takes Command. If the numbers are supposed to be different for this one, because it's larger areas, longer time periods, whatever, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to use the more restrictive ones that will prevent bypassing being as easy. Under the base rules, again, the, the lines would have collapsed by now. McPherson would be able to push his way through anyone except Hardy. Uh, Thomas would be able to push through Polk. Uh, and Cav would be able to just push through. And, and, and the, the situation would actually be more like the historical situation um, because Johnston basically could not hold the line. The leaders would... The enemy leaders hitting you would more or less indicate that, yeah, I'm not going to be able to prevent him from passing through. The troop density rules make this, I think, more realistic, and they're the only reason you need some kind of special rule for Johnston. And they're not in the rule book here, so, you know. <laughs> Maybe things changed. I do not have some second edition version of Marching Through Georgia's specific rules. Uh, I was able to find a second edition version of Mississippi Fortress. The rule is online, but I was not able to find these. And, you know, again, the system doesn't really make sense without those density rules, but as a whole, but it works for this scenario, maybe in a way that, like, is kind of illogical, but it makes Johnston unable to defend the lines that he should have been able to defend. Okay. Uh, so I'll take care of those cap battles, and we'll see if the U.S., if the Union forces get any kind of purchase that I'll allow them through. At the decision point, the first thing was down here, the Union won this battle significantly. Uh, they did a diversionary first and then an assault. Ended up doing, mm, uh, I think three points of damage to Hume across it. He might have had a point on him already, and only took one ourselves, so... Uh, and this is not a big enough force to prevent me from sliding through. Even though there's a crossing area, you know, I should be able to blockade the, uh, the crossing or whatever. Yeah, I don't think that, um, I don't think that's covered. Let me, let me take a look in Lee Takes Command and see if I'm wrong about that, because if I am, I kind of fucked up with this whole thing. This one is more interesting, though. The Union, I, I had to check my density. And for Lee Takes Command, Defensible Terrain, which is what this is, it has some green in it, I guess. <laughs> Again, it's hard to tell. Are these little bits of green and brown, you know, enough? What are these? Are these not, you know, again, the representation on the map, really, really hard to tell. Uh... I would be tempted to say that this is at not even defensible terrain, but I gave the bonus for it, so I don't know. I, it, I really hate the way the map works. Uh, there should be like a simple little symbol or something uh, to indicate it rather than the best, the, the only definitive place you can go is where they've listed them all out. The, the fucking terrain looking at it visually it just is not sufficient and therefore the map doesn't work you know maybe it's kind of pretty i don't know it looks like it's colored pencil kind of childish it's barber maps tend to look that way they don't impress me that much but in terms of giving me the uh, some people love them but in terms of giving me the information man they fucking suck <laughs> get me get me redmond simmons in to do this um but anyway so we have, uh, we have that situation, and we had a, a, the fighting go on, and Confederates took one hit. I think the Union took two over there because McCook already had one. I'm taking worse losses, but I've just gotten the Confederates down to 12 strength points, which means if I kill another Cav there, they're going to have to throw something else in there to prevent me from just pushing through, which is what I can do here too. Uh, unless, again, I'm wrong about the rules. So I'll check those rules, but I think what's going to happen is I'm going to launch another round of not very good combat, which would be better if I wasn't in, if this isn't defensible terrain, but again, can't tell. 
can't fucking tell. Everything's got some green in it. Uh, everything's got some brown in it. <laughs> and... This is, this is what we've got. Green tint over brown. Right? I mean, there's brown everywhere, right? Uh, defensible is supposedly in this game, and clear is supposedly in this game. Aha! Clear terrain. Okay, so is 100 one of the ones in the list? This is the only way you can tell. Yes, 100 should be clear terrain. So we're going to say they fought the first round in some little bushes or something. Uh, but yeah, now it's clear terrain. Okay. And yeah, there's no special rule in the troop density to say I can't push through the river thing. Maybe there is in the regular movement. Ooh. Let's go look at that. <laughs> uh, you know, I feel the same way about this as I do in some ways about another uh, Clash of Arms product, which is the uh, Dresda... Um, uh, Labatt game that they put out. The map is difficult to cope with. The components are difficult to cope with in terms of like trying to get information from them. Though the second part there, that's Labatt. I mean, uh, from back in the Marshall Enterprises games, which I think are still being made. They had the, oh, let's make, you know, something that has a picture of the uniform, which is totally fucking useless, but some attempt to duplicate minis with uh, all the information on the back and the information is all hidden from view. And you can't actually have the units all always face up to make them you know, visible or whatever, because then you can't tell whose it is because there's no color coding that works on the counters either. Not that you can really tell too much by the uniform, like you largely can, but there are cases where like, you know, British troops are wearing blue and French are wearing red or something like that. And you know, you just have to hope they're stacked together right, but if you have the preponderance of the units there, you can tell whose is what. Here at least they have these nice flags to do it. But again, the map had some problems, and the rules, trying to find the cross-reference, the specific rule, you maybe remember something, you maybe don't remember if you remember it, like I'm doing here, where I'm like, huh, okay, it's not in the troop density rules, but maybe it's in the base movement rules that I can't just push through the river. And since I haven't been using base movement rules, and since I wasn't dealing with pushing over the river in that way, uh, it wouldn't have worked in the last game I played. <clears throat> and I didn't want to do it here ever before. Uh, do I have, you know, do I have something that's gonna make something reasonable where the cav can actually protect this and force the enemy to batter their way through at some level or another. I'm not sure. I don't see anything in the rules that, that forces it. And when I played uh, Mississippi Fortress, Grant was able to just kind of walk into an area, push through the enemy, push through the next river line, whatever. So I think there's nothing there for that. But this is, this is one of the problems. And it, it, it's a clash of arms issue for me where their rule books are not well cross-referenced. Um, it's not immediately clear where something is gonna be. They're not terribly well written. They're kind of loose and kind of sketchy. I, I, don't get me wrong, I'm enjoying this system. Uh, <laughs> um, but I noticed with both of the tactical games I played of theirs, the Labatt game, which was the worst of the series ever, as far as I understand for the rules being completely screwed up, they made a specific mishmash rule book for uh, Dresd. Uh, and the specific rules one was screwed up, but that's pretty common. But the, the, uh, the, they didn't use a standard series rule book. They mixed Mary Louise and I don't know, whatever the regiment, <laughs> whatever the order, regimental orders book is, and kind of made something that's in between both and is unique to that game. And they mucked some shit up in it. Um, but the other game was the Battles of uh, the Age of Reason ones where concepts did not uh, settle in my brain that should have. And I, I raised, you know, this is unreasonable, but certainly from my reading of the rules, I got a completely different impression than uh, what I guess was supposed to happen now. I don't know if that's the rules fault or me, 
<laughs> both are possible. A combination of the two is quite possible. With this one, I think I'm mostly getting it right. Uh, but I do have to kind of patch things together and make them up as I go. Uh, because again, there's not the kind of discipline that you see in, well, ideally in SPI. Uh, but, you know, even, even other modern companies like Compass and GMT seem to have a little bit better discipline towards their rules than uh, Clash of Arms tends to. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and I just bought Summer Storm and its expansion. Ooh, I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. Another Gettysburg game, man. Okay. Um, so, it looks like if I can reduce the Confederates by another strength point, it's a worthwhile cause. But the cost may be too high. Didn't work. <laughs> Obviously, I wasn't going to do anything on the uh, CIC, although I hurt the Union with it. Uh, but on the die roll table... I didn't come up with a winner, so I'm not getting through if these units stay there. That's important because this space is protecting both of these spaces. If I lose this, the whole format, the whole, uh, the whole stand could have fallen. So, was it worth it or not? You know, obviously, if I could know in advance that I had a good chance of getting it, but was it worth taking that high risk? Um, that I, you know, high payoff, but chance, but low, low chance um, attack that I just made. I don't know. And how high is the payoff? The Confederates could certainly throw some infantry in here, and then it's all over, man. You know, I'm not breaking through, but then I've weakened this, and the Union can punch through there, maybe. I don't know. Uh, my feeling is it's going to just wait until the Army of Tennessee pushes through there, and I've ended up paying some victory points. And maybe more, maybe less important, hard to tell, some calf. Especially since I'm going to be fucking with uh, their positioning by moving into there. Now, the nice thing is the Confederates get a chance to fall back, and they're not prevented from doing so uh, by not having a combat card counter because of their special retreat rule. Again, there's something very wrong. That... The defender should almost always be able to give ground like this uh, <laughs> because you can't adequately defend. Otherwise, uh, just pulling this cav out would require me pulling my whole army out. And that is using an optional rule from second edition as well, which is not in this game. Um, which is to say, the game as written, the Confederate line is just going to collapse due to lack of supply regularly in this game, I think, unless they get very, very lucky. So the, the set of rules that I have for first edition, don't work. Uh, the question is what you can patch together or if there was a second edition. Um, well, this has second edition rules, right? No, this does not. Uh, but if there was a second edition modification to this, maybe that helps somehow? I don't know. Again, it's a clash of arms, man. <laughs> you, you just swallow it. You just take what they give you <laughs> and you figure out what to do with it. There's something else I can do. <laughs> I can launch attacks using infantry. Uh, this makes a, a hard call. First of all, the Union don't know what just moved in here. It could be a couple of dummies. I can't really afford to stick around. If I run, the Cav is the only thing that can chase me. Um, here's what I know. The calf that I hit there is ineffective now, which means it can't attack. Uh, so I don't even know why it's there. Um, so I, I'm going to get my infantry chewed up there. So I am going to fall back. <laughs> I keep my combat marker on there. Confederates get theirs as well. That's just weakened this though, which maybe makes for an opportunity. Unfortunately, I can't really abandon the line that I've got. It's too short. Uh, I could leave something defensive here, move a wagon into here, and, and try to launch an attack with partial forces, but I don't know how much. That could still be a bunch of dummy, well, it could be like one small unit or something like that that just scared me away. Same thing's happening here. And again, here I know the Confederates could just be attacking with Cav. However, there's not much advantage to me fighting there, 
so I am going to just fall back from there as well. And the Confederates just fixed their problem. And it was a big problem. I could not lose the river line at this point. I, I just can't afford to. I looked at the hood rules. I, there's too much game left. Um, the only thing that could be defended is Atlanta. And if that's the case, I can't defend the rail lines going into Atlanta without doing counterattacks and all kind of crap like that. That's just going to lose me the whole area. <laughs> you cannot trust Hood to do anything in this <laughs> at this point in the in the war. I mean, he's fine as a corps commander, I guess. He's losing limbs and all kind of crap. But anyway, let's push forward. And we're going to take a little break because we have to do a lot of rules lookups and thought. We don't like doing thought. Union probes into Lost Mountain with cavalry, finds out there's nothing there, and you can see they shifted forces up into here, putting them in a position to actually either launch a massive assault on Kennesaw Mountain or push uh, into here, whatever this is, Powder Springs, something like that. Uh, with all the different creek names and everything in the same font as the name of the area, sometimes it's hard to tell if you have one or two areas there. Again, the map graphics issues. Uh, you can see the calf pulled back over here. Otherwise, digging in here and uh, not doing anything too exciting, actually. I got room to drop another entrenchment there. Um, but positioning themselves to try to violate this line now. And it's not clear what I can do, what I should do to defend against uh, this kind of circumstance. It looks like there's a risk that this could fall. Um, there's a risk that the attack could land here. And of course, there's always the possibility I could just slam into here because I don't need this space particularly. It's a long walk back to the rail lines <laughs> to cut them. And I screwed up with the Union badly. Uh, Confederate cav force marched to here. Able to do the last part in the road. Did a probe. Found something a yummy to eat. That's one of the wagons gone. That's a big deal. Now, I took some uh, stragglers due to that, but I was just too ambitious and left a route open that was worth uh, worth looking at. Ouch. Um, that severely limits the Union now. Now they only have two supply wagons. They lose another one, they probably can't get through. They need those supply wagons to be able to do outflanks. Uh, otherwise, they're just gonna have to pummel through the heart of the line. So, this could be really a big problem, and it may force me to launch an attack, you know, somewhere in the heart of the line now, while it's probably weaker than when the Confederates can uh, cut their uh, their risk down a little bit. Because this isn't even a necessary supply wagon. I thought it was kind of safe because it's just moving along trying to get up to the back. But they saw their opportunity, and they just grabbed a shot at it and got something something good there. It could have been nothing big, but you know what? If it was a dummy or something, no biggie there either. I'm pressing my way in both directions to challenge, uh, to try to raid those lines. I decided this isn't necessarily that far. <laughs> Not when I can march two to three uh, hexes a turn. Because the Union had another wagon here pulling back, can only move one space per turn. It's a heat turn, so I can't force march very easily. I had no easy way to protect this. In fact, I had no way to protect it, um, except to throw some cav into here. That'll prevent him from just pressing through because he didn't get a combat marker for just exposing uh, a supply wagon, which is just automatically destroyed. So, unlike dummies, if that had been a dummy, if there had been a dummy there, uh, I would have had to declare combat on it, but. I don't think that's the case with the uh, supply wagons. It's just a little bit of weird difference. Um, that means that the Confederates can't just run out and go and capture this other one here. Uh, however, you can see the Union line kind of shifted a little bit. Uh, 
not it doesn't look like it did much but we're positioning ourselves for a possible attack up onto here uh, not that that's absolutely obvious to the confederates uh just looks like pretty much the same kind of stuff except for the cab running down here however i can pull back out of here without a problem and then you know continue to threaten uh, the rail line and keep causing problems for the uh for the union in terms of a risk you know of multiple different places with a couple of calf units and this calf unit's having to run back as well to protect the back ends against raids because the amount of points as well as the straggler hits but mainly the amount of points that can be generated off of throwing a lot of units out of supply at this point the confederates are already uh what 16 points in the lead if they throw the entire union army out of supply they can give up atlanta at that point they can just withdraw and say we did enough <laughs> And that's the point that you do not want to let the Confederates get to. And the Rebel Cav continues to play around at the fringes, see what it can do, see if it can do something to loosen the situation up so that what looks like a pretty bad case right now. You know, there's a few things. One, I'm taking risks that might win me the game. Secondly, I'm doing things that's forcing the Union to shift around so that they don't have, uh, so that they can't move as quickly. And that's important because there aren't a lot of turns left. I got enough time, if I can run out the clock a little bit by doing shit like this, even if it's costing me some victory points, it's not that bad a thing. All right. And once again, shifts down to prevent uh, the Confederate calf from being able to move quickly here. I did a probe here, made sure there was real calf there. Uh, and actually now I'm declaring an attack, which gets me one of these markers. Uh, the Confederates don't want to stick around. Um, they'll fight just Cav, but the Union decides that they're not going to intercept. And I am going to push this where? I can push it here or here. I don't think I can flee back this way. Hmm. Ah, uh, interesting. The retreat rules in the base game, I think, allow me to go here. And I'm not sure that the modification for density prevents that, which is a problem if that's the case. Base rules require you to retreat towards your home area. There's a sequence that handles it. I just, I get so lost because there is a complexity to area movement that's just not present in other kinds of movement. Okay, so this is impacted and that's like that. Um, and now we're on the Confederate side of the turn. And you can see the Union is just not really getting its grip on you know, how, how to get through here. And anytime I want to, I can just slam it to here or here. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure that's not going to work very well. That's not the way this game helps you. You know, I mean, it's ugly. First of all, these rough areas, the defenders doubled. And with the entrenchments and everything, man, I'm just not going to be able to blast through that at all easily unless there's garbage there. And it doesn't look like there's garbage there. Whereas if I can punch here, maybe I can get through that. Even if it's stronger. It doesn't look strong, though. The Rebels tried to move their cav here. The Union uh, intercepted them. They threw more cav in. We're going to have uh, at least one round of combat the Union has to throw in, into play. Uh, and that's screening this. Because otherwise, the Confederates could have gone one, two, uh, three into there. There's no heat this turn, so it would be not an unreasonable uh, run and i'm pretty damn sure that's a supply wagon and if i can get them down to one supply wagon their options are so limited <laughs> and while that's moving slowly around turns are churning uh i made a roll at the beginning of this turn for the union see if they just went up the middle and tried to bust their way through because again 
that clock's running out. But man, that would have been a bloody fight. By the way, every time I see Kennesaw Mountain, I can only think of uh, the baseball commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landis. You know, I just it was a name that always stuck in my head, and now I know where it's probably from. Interception combat is not going well. Uh, the Union hitting the Confederate cavalry in the rough terrain with all the penalties against it. They took themselves over to the worst side of the table. Firepower didn't work well. They've lost two strength points so far. Of course, they're not going to continue the attack, but now the Confederates are going to slam back in. And they know exactly what they're facing, so they can kind of make some judgment based on that. So I am facing uh, two strength points plus McCook's one. There's an ineffective unit, so the Union's going to have to withdraw. I know everything about them. Uh, I think they have to withdraw. Is it if it's any ineffective or if it's all ineffective? Let me see. I'm not sure it's under restrictions. I couldn't put it in the line. So here's the way it's worded. Ineffective uh, unit may not, when possible, be deployed alone in a line position. If it's forced to be deployed ineffective alone in a line position, I must select withdraw. So I believe I can do everything except I can't counterattack, which I'm not about to do. So I can do the stand, which might be my best choice, um, but it might not. <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, Confederates will be able to pin me in place if I don't withdraw, so it might not be my best option. It worked out about even. Uh, Union Confederates both took a loss. The Confederates on the CIC table, but they've just turned both these Union cab ineffective. Uh, that doesn't make them completely worthless, but it makes them pretty fucking close. I can just pass by them and stuff. So uh, what we're going to see is one, two, th I could get that far next turn, which is definitely threatening. And what's worse is I got nobody protecting the rail line back here. So I could cut off the entire Union Army. That's game over, man. Uh, so by winning that Cav battle, I have forced the Union to have to do something big. This game could be over right now. It's not over, but it's fucking close. The Union has a calf here that I can put in here and prevent these guys from moving. But then I'm sacrificing another lone calf unit to the fight. I'm not sure. I don't think I can move into an opposing space with ineffective units. Um, there's a whole series of things they can't do, and it's not getting effective any any time ever again. Uh, may not gain any victory points. May not force march. Does not block enemy line of communication. That's okay. This guy can. Uh, uh, no probe or intercept, which means it can't. These guys can't prevent these from leaving. So they don't really help. Yeah. So I'm not going to be able to use those extra couple of strength points for anything valuable. Uh, here's the problem. I can go one, two, three to there. This guy can make it down one, two, and then force march to there. And that gives me some coverage. That would force a river crossing for there. Uh, can I get into here or here with anyone? He can't make it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in some really tough troubles to try to defend my rail line. And then here's the other problem. The calves aren't going to be able to hold off that stronger Confederate calf. Another calf, you know, if this is running over here to help try to slow this down, this calf is able to run up and start doing shit and maybe threaten even further back you know, uh, with, a, with a really deep raid. You cut that line though, even one turn out of supply, there's no way the Union's going to win. There's just too many units, which means the Union Army has to you know, commit a fair sized force to try to defend this against this calf. Uh, say, you know, one of the armies or something. Well, I don't have the oomph to go forward in that case. Uh, I kind of think this is a point at which the Union should concede and say, hey, 
we actually got stopped from taking Atlanta. This wasn't a matter of, you know, <laughs> uh, this isn't a matter of like, yeah, you know, I just didn't make it in time or something. I got stymied, man, by the damn Confederate calf and me being too sloppy with my lines because I could have prevented this shit from happening. Um, there's no question about that. I was just sloppy. I think I'm going to pack this one in. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's a whole lot for me to show that I haven't, you know, I mean, I'm just going to be playing out the mechanisms of trying to defend the rail line and I'm not going to be able to proceed with uh, any offensive actions that I can think. Let me, uh, I don't know, let me finish this turn, see what it looks like, see if I come up with anything, but it does not look good to me. And I found me a way to do it. <laughs> I'm going to declare an attack here. If he wants to withdraw, he can. If he doesn't, he doesn't have to. Um, I don't know whether it's Cav or not, but if I withdraw, it has to be to here, falling back towards my home, which puts me in an ugly position. Even though the forces that are chasing me came from behind, <laughs> I can't keep running this way, <clears throat> which means um, I don't know if I want to stick around or not. I mean, part of me thinks this could be a ploy. And in fact, I forgot to make a straggle check because it's not a ploy. <laughs> it's a unit that force marked out of here. Um, and took some da damage. Uh, but yeah, and I've got forces you know, pushing up this way to defend that line if need be. I think I've got a way forward, but, um, yeah. Am I disrupting the Union enough? I don't know. I mean, if I lose this cav, I lose my disruptor. That's the problem. Whereas if I go here, I can keep pressing around and throwing a threat. One in six chance I stick around and see what happens. I do not. I run. He could try to intercept me, but he chooses not to. He does not want to intercept that shit. And I got a straggle to go there. And, and the thing is, I mean, I've got like an army corps in there. <laughs> you know, something fairly significant. And I brought the leader up here and everything so that I could do that. All right, over to the Rebs. The rebel position, Kev back up here, making a threat. This isn't a cutoff space, so if the Union can get this all garrisoned back here, I don't have to worry too, so much about the cav. But now that I've lost my cav advantage, or my cav parity, I got problems because now there's cav coming up here. And again, that could run all the way up, and I can't defend the whole supply line since I lost so much Union cavalry. I'm in a big world of hurt. And I don't know what I can do about it. I think I have lost the campaign based on it. It may be time to smash up the middle and see if I can make a run for it. We'll think <laughs> while I make dinner. The disruptive attacks of the cavalry need to garrison all the way back. It's causing too much, too much trouble. Um, I still can't protect this. Confederates could go one, two, three there. Yeah, I forgot to check for weather. Okay, nothing special. Um, I'm making a punch right down the rail line, see what happens. But I don't have much hope. I think Sherman just has to probably fall back. But this is sort of the last ditch effort to take Atlanta while I try to protect that supply line because I, I don't have the cav uh, to patrol and I'm using real units to try to defend uh, territory all over the place now. Well, after the first round of combat assaults with both the Union uh, armies, I'm only allowed, I may have screwed this up before, I'm only allowed two wings because the defender picked one. It's possible that the attacker could only have one wing against three for the defender, uh, but you're only allowed two to one on a defensive position, and that's 
uh, kind of a hindrance, but I have a lot of strength, enough to get me two to one odds, which meant with the assaults it worked out pretty well. Uh, two to one odds even with the rough terrain bonus because I picked a place where there weren't much left. <laughs> and what's kind of interesting is there's not enough there to prevent me from continuing to march through on my next turn. Now, obviously, because I need to control the rail line, that's not going to work. I don't think I can make it to Atlanta anyway, uh, simply because I can't afford to defend my rail line against the Confederate Cav and provide this oomph. But, you know, um, now comes the hard question of, the Union's going to hit again. Does the Confederate want to stand here? Um, there is an advantage to doing so. But if I can spread his rail line, you know, out further, I've got room to try to slip my cav in behind him. Maybe this is a Confederate cav and not this. And then these spaces have to be defended. You know, there's all kinds of stuff like that. The simple fact that I can't bottle the Confederate cav in um, without throwing units out of supply or whatever, and I had to already back my line out of here, means that I don't have the strength to go forward. So not only did we blow Hinman to uh, being no longer an effective unit, we took out all the artillery, which is a big deal because artillery gets multiplied even in not particularly good terrain. So, and we took the location and we've got the rail line going straight down. It looks not great for the Confederates either. The only thing that's saving their ass right now is the threat to the rail line. Um, I'm gonna have to fall back. Where, how, what, don't know. Might end up with Hood in charge, and that might be Sherman's only saving grace here. Is uh, uh, He might have some chance at getting in there uh, with Hood in, in command. And remember, I can't just sit on Atlanta because if I run out of supplies, I'm in trouble, which means I have to defend the Confederate supply lines as well, at least one of them. This one looks the easiest, but, you know, just holding the space like that would be valuable too. But those units have to counterattack, and that makes Atlanta almost impossible to defend. The fact that Hood is, like, psychotic. <laughs> and he really is. Um, but if I can avoid having to give up that space, having to let the Union across the river with infantry, then things become different, and I can tighten my line. What I can't do is get this back. I can go in there. That might be enough. Force the Union to try to bash their way through another core. I don't know. Because I got a lot of room back here now. <laughs> The Confederates slid over, putting a core, probably a core in there. I mean, it doesn't do any good if it's just a bunch of dummies, um, or cab for that matter. It can't really do anything in that case. But it blocks the road, you know, it blocks the railway. In addition, we grab the railroad here, here, potentially. Those might be dummies, in which case I can't score the points for them, right, <laughs> for cutting the line. Um, I did a, a scout here and didn't find anything or found nothing, which is kind of cool, and shifted around elsewhere. And I'm also scouting here and I found a unit of that cow that's not in great shape and I'm gonna try to bust my way through that. The basic idea here is to keep, the, keep Sherman so disoriented in terms of the cow raids going against his rear that he just cannot keep pushing forward um, effectively and to just hold him pinned. I've got a lead in victory points, and I've got 25 points for Atlanta. As long as I don't let him over the river, I'm okay. <laughs> and I can let him over late in the game, like in the last couple of turns. But I, there's still enough time that I fear that Hood can fuck this up. <laughs> the only combat action, the Union managed to withdraw without taking losses. Confederates took a loss. Not a good result for them. They probably were a little overly aggressive. Um, probably thought it was a one strength point in effective unit I wanted to overrun. Anyway, uh, didn't even roll the die to see what I would do, but then kind of quite often I look and I see, huh, 
that's not as weak as I thought it would be, <laughs> or something along that line, like this. I didn't think I had an easy chance to bust through it. Boom! Easily. Easily. Of course, that was two armies hitting basically one brigade, but yeah. <laughs> one brigade and divisional artillery. Uh, but now, there's something else in the way, and uh, my hopes are pretty low. It's trying to clean up its supply problems and making that attack there, but one of them is no big deal and it's cleaned up. I can get rid of this. That's not going to matter, I don't think. Yeah, might. Uh, the other one here, um, the Rebs want to get out of there. This is an infantry unit. I don't want to face that, so I'll fall back. Uh, and then we have the major battle to do. But we got a new Confederate Corps in place and we can just keep swapping commands into into um, into the hellhole. And the Union's just not gonna be able to batter their way through, but we'll keep going. I fucked up. These guys uh, couldn't have blocked the supply line so I would have known they were fake and they could have dismissed them. These guys successfully blocked it. And what that means, because it happened during the communication phase, is that the Union Army here has strength halved, all the units had to make a straggle check. I'm just calling this at this point. Um, I, I don't think the Union has any chance, even if I was able to batter my way through, although it's only Polk standing in the way right now. I've got Hardy's first core um, are ready to shift in for the most part next turn. So, um, even though two Union armies is a pretty big force, it's just not going to be able to batter its way through without supply. Plus, I just, uh, well, I, I cleared the, the, the victory point penalty part, but I'm just not going to be able to make it to, um, uh, to Atlanta. And I want to get this cleaned up. I don't feel like, you know, spending another day, two days, trying to get through four or five turns, four more turns that are kind of useless. It's not like the turns take that long. It's just I get, I start working again tomorrow, and I know the amount of time that I spend is, you know, especially when I'm facing something that I don't really want to complete. Uh, so what, what can we say about this? Well, <laughs> something that I uh, mentioned in the Mississippi Fortress game. It is possible to lose this game on a stupid error. The Union could have protected itself from this problem. It's also quite possible, though, that the bluffing, that the hidden movement and everything, and some of that is less effective in a solo game, can cause the same kind of error situations. Are those errors unreasonable? No. In a way, they're, they're part of, you know, the fog of war and, and the kind of frictions and the kind of really, really weird things that happen. And so in that sense, I find the game very appealing. <laughs> it does feel a little disheartening though to play through most of a game like this, get to a point that was kind of in doubt and then have it fall apart um, by a stupid mistake. And that's always kind of a, an annoying thing that can happen in a game. Um, you know, it's not like this was a hugely long game, but I would say this is something that probably I wouldn't be able to get done in a sitting normally. Um, it's a little longer than most of the games of these. So, uh, Lee Takes Command and Mississippi Fortress, I kind of said, <laughs> these kind of feel like magazine games. Well, okay. Some of the SPI magazine games were pretty long, and things like Proud Monster come out, and they're pretty long too, and come in a magazine format originally. Uh, the Desert Fox comes to mind as one that took a fair amount of time. Um, conquistador, maybe, you know. Uh, so I use the term magazine game in kind of the wrong light there. You know, I mean, Twilight Struggle. Is a pretty short game, but it comes with lots of fancy components, all the cards and everything, so it feels a little different. These kind of feel uh, like that, but this one is a little longer, 
And whenever I've got a game that takes me more than one, one reasonable session, and this one would probably take a weekend of play uh, with me opposed. With other players, maybe not so much. Uh, it, uh, you know, it feels like it fills a bigger itch, but it sucks when that itch gets kind of foiled by stupidity on one person's side and error a blunder. And with everything hidden, it's both more likely, as I pointed out, and also uh, somewhat, um, you know, you can't reverse it in the same way. If you're sitting there with someone and they make an error in front of you, and you're kind of like, eh, yeah, I, I see that you, you did that. But here everything's hidden, and you're kind of like, well, yeah, I, I understand you fucked up, but it's not like it was right in front of me, and I can't quite understand what the options you had and everything were. So I can't really say, yeah, we can just go back on that. That didn't really impact me. That didn't change the game outside of you screwing up. <laughs> you, know? you used your pieces to bluff me, and, well, I saw an opportunity that, where there was a hole, and took advantage of that, and, you know, the game wouldn't have gone anything like what it has because of that. Anyway, uh, I did find this one particularly interesting, even within that, in terms of this one had much more maneuvering to uh, get around an obstacle, and a lot of that comes down to what caused the fuck up, which is the supply line. The supply rules in this one, the fact that both sides, you know, aren't just, eh, did he slip around me there? You actually have a traced line you must protect with the rail line. And I feel like that makes it a more interesting game than most of the ones that I've seen um, before. I have one more to do, presumably. I'm not sure how much soul I have for it right now after this one, but we'll see. Uh, which is the Grant Takes Command, and I've got all the pieces from it here. It came out in this Art of War Annal. Um, it comes with two different scenarios. One which is a modified scenario, which is a scenario using the uh, Autumn of Glory uh, map and maybe other pieces as well, which I do not have yet. I hope to someday. And the other one uh, uses Lee Takes Command, and it handles uh, Grant's Wilderness Campaign, basically the Lee versus Grant down there game situation that I've played before. And I'm kind of intrigued by it. I haven't looked to see how big it is. I'm, I don't think I have the energy for another one of these right away. And I also have a couple things I want to take a look at first. So I, this may end up going on hold for, for forever, like some other series did, you know? Alexander, I never got back to. Eh, there was a move involved in that. But um, oh, there was another, well, like the CWB series. I made it through a lot of them. And then... It's hard to get back into the, oh yeah, let's get all keyed up for that and play the couple of remaining ones uh, that are left. And they're not small games, so it's not like, you know, it's not like I'm wasting a lot of effort to get back into it. It's just I've got so many damn things that I want to play that I don't know. All right, let's send this up. Uh, the problem that I'm left with is I want to do a review for the series, and I kind of want to play that last game that I have available to me to do before I do so. <laughs> but if I'm not sure if I'm going to go back to it, ugh, that puts me in kind of the Gloomhaven situation of, do I want to do a review before? And then by doing it, I almost sealed the fate. Uh, I don't think I played any more Gloomhaven after I did the review. All right, let's end it up.